All right. Greetings from the dark continent. Conscious Caracal here, Adams Van Sale, here to shine a light on the goings on, not just south of Africa, but also north and west and east and in the center as well. Tonight, uh, joining me is uh, Colonel Chris Wyatt. Uh, he has previously been on the on the channel for specifically this topic earlier this year but those of you who have good memories will remember that during that episode my uh, third world internet just completely uh, shut down and it was impossible for me to carry on with the episode so I thought let's do a proper redo on it so I rescheduled uh, with Chris and I'm very glad that he could make time last time we did give you guys a little bit of background, but I'm just going to uh, start off again. We have probably some new viewers here as well that are not familiar. So uh, Chris Wyatt is the former director of African Studies at the U.S. Army War College, and uh, he also accumulated 36 years of Army service under his belt. Uh, he is the principal and CEO at the Indaba Africa Group and has accumulated a following on his YouTube channel where he has surpassed me uh, very quickly for the second round now, seeing as <laughs> this is the second the tri- bite of the cherry with his YouTube channel and uh, he already surpassed me. Um, and they analyze the news and politics, both from his own country in uh, the United States, but also South Africa and other countries. Chris's fields of speciality include foreign area officer, linguist, counterintelligence, counterterrorism, signals intelligence, education, international development, and more. Chris, we would be sitting here for another 20 minutes if I continue with your CV. Is there anything important that I left out? Uh, no, no, no. It's, uh, it's, it's, a, it's a lot. So, um, it's, it's, it's sometimes it's actually been embarrassing. You know, I, uh, I, on my channel, I try to be modest. Uh, we joke about, you know, egos and things, but I tr- do try to be modest because it, there's really is a lot there. When, when someone else reads my full CV, I, I sit back and go, wow. Okay. <laughs> Who's that Oak? Who did all that? You know, it's, uh, and it's not just a question of do it, did it. I'm, I'm still trying to do the stuff. So, you know, life is, is an adventure. And I think that you got to grab the nettle and grasp that nettle and, and mm. get out there. So that's what I try to do. But yeah, there's a lot more, but uh, let's get to the topics and talk about Africa because yeah. we could be here for a while. Like you said, before we get to the topic, yeah. there's a, a weird synchronicity here. Um, just in the uh, previously uh, an hour ago, I was on Chris Wyatt's channel to talk about my documentary self Steed. And I mentioned the Christian Democratic Youth of Slovakia writing oh. a, 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 a review of the documentary on their website. And Andre is here uh, in the chat. Uh, he was actually the contact there in Slovakia that wrote or uh, that wrote the, the the review and sent it to me. Um, and yeah, it's very nice to see him here in the in the chats as well. It's a nice little synchronicity there. I was just talking about that review with uh, with Chris. Yeah, and he, he missed he missed all the nice things I said about Slovakia, about the High Tatra Mountains, about the interesting history, breaking up with the Czech Republic. Uh, had some nice things to say about it on my channel. <laughs> Andre, go watch my channel and see what I had to say. I <laughs> <laughs> uh, would highly recommend it. All right, but Chris, let's jump into the topic. Um, I think the. The first question that I wanted to ask you is actually, I think, the most important one because it sets the table for the entire conversation that we're going to have here. And that's the core question of why should you be paying attention to what or caring about what's happening on the African continent as a European, an American, an Asian, uh, any Asian country, China, Japan, any of these countries looking at Africa? Why should you care? Well, for those countries, there are some immediate near term. Oh, hang on. Mirror you there. <laughs> I got to mirror you there. Uh, the, for for those countries, there are some immediate. Um, I'll watch from the review. Okay, well, thank you. Um, yeah, so uh, there are some immediate near term issues, but for me, it's a long term geostrategic geopolitical view. For me, I look at Africa in 2050. In 2050, Africa will have 2.3 billion inhabitants. It will have, in my own estimation, 900 million consumers. Consumer to me is somebody who, after they meet their basic needs, has some form of disposable income. To me, that is an incredibly large market that one cannot ignore. And uh, much of the world ignoring that. So for me, that's the long-term focus out to 2050. I'm a strategic thinker, but also a tactical operator. And from a tactical perspective, an operational perspective, using military terms, the near-term issues for about Africa are as it continues to be a source of unwanted migration, uh, illegal migration from Africa into Europe. So that's an immediate issue for Africans. It's also a major source of hydrocarbons and of materials that the world needs to fuel its industrialization 
and its fourth wave of industrialization in the information age. So it remains important from that standpoint. Uh, beyond that, to Africa, for some players, is a convenient place to sell their wares, China in particular, and some major corporations in the United States and in Europe who also sell their things in Africa. Uh, but beyond that, uh, honestly, the continent doesn't matter a whole lot. People talk about it as a breeding ground for terrorism, but the terrorism in Africa rarely comes out of Africa going elsewhere. It's been largely confined to Africa. So while it's noteworthy and it's something to address, it's not something that's directly affected folks. For instance, in Kenya, where there have been a lot of terrorist attacks, never have the Al-Shabaab terrorists ever intentionally targeted a U.S. interest in Kenya. They have targeted Kenyan interests and they've targeted Uganda and they've targeted Ethiopia, but they've never, to my knowledge, ever targeted U.S. interests because even though we're we're bombing them with uh, with drones and and with aircraft and we're training the uh, the Amazon force that's there, the African Union mission in Somalia, uh, they, they don't target us because they, they probably realize that's a bad idea to piss us off. But um, even though we're pissing them off. But anyway, it's uh, beyond that. I don't think that Africa. Uh, is is sort of what a lot of the in, the uh, analysts and think tanks claim it is. So, for instance, the Wilson Center, a uh, left of center think tank here in America, named after one of the big biggest racists in American history, uh, President, Woodrow, President Woodrow Wilson. <laughs> oh, you just wanted to show off your cup, yeah, yeah, yeah. Eh? No, I just <laughs> made you a drink there. <laughs> so you got Delaray, I got Uns <laughs> Yeah. yeah. So um, Woodrow Wilson, one of the biggest racists in history, in the United States, the man who the shame of our nation for our history forever. The first motion picture ever aired in the White House was the movie The Birth of a Nation, which is a racist screed calling for lynching and in favor of the Ku Klux Klan. Woodrow Wilson aired that in the White House. He also, uh, for the first time in the history of the United States, segregated the federal workforce. Prior to Woodrow Wilson, black and white Americans worked side by side in the federal workforce for decades until he segregated. Anyway, the Wilson Center is named after him. And this is what they say are the big things for this year. They say that intensifying major power competition in Africa, don't buy that story. That's a fairy tale. Confronting the challenge of climate change, don't buy that story. And the war in northern Ethiopia, what happens next? I think that's just they stuck that in there because they can come up with a third thing. Yeah, what does happen next in Ethiopia where the world's not looking away? So there, there are other bigger issues to be concerned about here. These are just the red herrings in my book. Um, but Africa, honestly, is not a major issue for the world. Um, despite the fact that Africans think it is, it just isn't. Sorry. Hmm. All right. Um, last time we started off with uh, security and conflict, and I think that's a good place to start again. And uh, the 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 place where we started last time is uh, actually just looking back. We had a conversation in I think twenty twenty or twenty twenty one, also doing an overview of of Africa, and. Uh, the question there was specifically where is conflict heating up where is it becoming destabilized uh, now here in 2023 uh, where are the points of destabilization where is the points of conflict uh, to be looking at uh, on the african continent that caught your eye well there are a number of places that are destabilized and are in the process of continuing to destabilize but there, there's they aren't new the new kid on the block, the place that is destabilizing, which no one wants to admit, wants to talk about, and I can tell you from anecdotal firsthand experience six months ago compared to just this past week and my five weeks in South Africa, is South Africa. South Africa is is a boiling cauldron of chaos just below the surface, in which 60 million people most go about their daily business and deal with the petty crime, the violent crime, the inconveniences, the load shedding, all these things, not realizing just how close South Africa is to the powder keg. Now, I don't want to sound like a a uh, Cassandra or, you know, the sky is falling or South Africa is going to start killing each other. I'm not saying that. What I am saying is that things are a powder keg and it doesn't take much to set a powder keg off when all that explosive is sitting there. All the things that could lead to serious, violent civil conflict and collapse of state control are there. And we've already seen it. We've had a dress rehearsal in July of 2021. The ANC's internal insurrection in KwaZulu-Natal province and in parts of Hauteng province are evidence of what can happen and how quickly things can go south. I mean, it happened overnight after Jacob Zuma failed to turn himself in and after Beckett Tilly and the police commissioner Sitoli failed to follow through on the constitutional court's order and were also in contempt of the court, which everybody seems to have conveniently forgotten about. They were supposed to arrest him between the 4th and the 8th. They failed to do that. He turned himself in the early morning hours of the 9th at the escort correctional facility. And within hours, they targeted 100 um, trucks at the Mui River toll plaza on the most important road in all of Southern Africa, coming up from Durban into Hauteng, supplying all of Hauteng and 
Southern Africa. And that's where it all started. So we've seen a dress rehearsal. The South Africa is on the edge. Uh, look, I'm not, you know, people are going around uh, going after that guy, K.W. Miller, because he's talking about a grid collapse and all that. Look, I'm not here to tell you that, that, that South Africa is about to fall apart. It can stop. It can be prevented. But the government in place today seems to have no cognizance of what's going on or doesn't care that they are on the precipice of crisis beyond imagination. And that's really where we sit. South Africa is, is the country that's really on the edge. Zimbabwe is not on the edge because Zimbabweans are shockingly patient. They'll, they'll be abused, raped, murdered, and they just look the other way. Um, but Zimbabwe has elections this year, which could be quite, quite painful and quite violent as well. But I don't see Zimbabwe collapsing any further. But South Africa, I'm not predicting a collapse, but I'm going to tell you, if the grid goes down for 72 hours, it will be chaos all over every major metropolitan center will be total chaos and there are insufficient law enforcement insufficient security resources to stop it and a lack of will by the government so there you go hmm. uh, outside south africa chris is there any other countries i mean uh, mozambique where we're going to get to the neighbors of south africa but let's look a bit further north and maybe west africa are there any countries there that are or east africa even that are uh, also heating up in regards to conflict well, there's a, a number of countries in the Sahel region are still dealing with insurgencies and uh, terrorist organizations, not to mention the traditional cartels that do smuggling through the Sahel. Uh, and those countries include Mauritania, which still faces some challenge. Uh, Mali, which is still in crisis, still has a war ongoing. Niger, which faces, you know, the cartels, terrorists. Domestic. They've got everything they're facing and very few resources. In addition, Burkina Faso has suffered horribly ever since the conflict found its way there a few years ago. And it continues to get worse. The country is destabilized and the military is running that now. And it's just a mess. Cameroon is suffering. And perhaps Africa's most important country, which isn't South Africa anymore, it's Nigeria. Uh, perhaps South Africa or Africa's most important country is also on the precipice, but Nigeria is, is perpetually on the precipice of collapsing. So I don't think it's going to collapse, but Nigeria, banditry, kidnappings, uh, looting, oil bunkering, corruption, uh, insurgencies, you name it, they've got it all. Nigeria is a total security disaster. The last place I'd want to live in this world other than New Zealand under Jacinda Ardern is uh, Nigeria. <laughs> so uh, that's that's in the West Africa. But if we move a little, if you want to go a little further afield, we can talk about that as well. Hmm. I see a question here. Uh, nice to see Lev in the in the chat. Thank you very much for for tuning in, uh, the host of the the Break the Rules podcast uh, that I've appeared on. Um, he asks no super chats. Uh, no, I've uh, I've uh, told my uh, my audience uh, the day when I can't keep up with my chat. It's moving too fast. Uh, will be the day that I re-enable a super chat. So you actually get something for the donation that you make. Uh, I, I, from my side, it just feels fair that uh, you don't just throw money my way. You actually get something. It highlights your comments. So the, the, the day when uh, my chat starts getting uh, completely chaotic and I can't uh, keep up with everyone's messaging, I'll re-enable super chats. And uh, then you can uh, get get a bang for your buck and you can actually get something for the for the donation for now if you want to really throw money somewhere and you live abroad you can always become a, a friend of afri forum just go to friends of afri forum and uh, donate some money there to the bigger cause uh, rather than just uh, giving it to me here for doing my hobby um but chris there's a uh, now that you mention it uh, is there anyone i mean since the last time we've talked about two years ago is there anyone any African country that has come back from the brink that was in a in a bad destabilized uh, conflict ridden situation and has managed to stabilize themselves in the past or in the in the past two years are there any of those cases in the past two years oh that's two, tough. three and years in, uh, in the past minus, yes recent, in the past yeah. yes but but recently no i mean rwanda is a good example of a country that came back mm -hmm. unfortunately they're suffering under totalitarian fascists but but i guess that's what it took to stabilize it uh, No, in the past two years uh mauritania is a little more stable than it was a couple of years ago um beyond that it's really hard to say i mean things have not really improved uh, ethiopia i suppose you could look at it and say the conflict is over but once again that's a conflict that's bubbling just below the surface the tigrayans who for decades ruled the roost in the multi-ethnic state of ethiopia were sidelined by the president Abe, who pushed them out and they had been in power for so long they took offense and 
they took up arms and uh, we had a conflict in Ethiopia. But that conflict is currently tamped down. One could argue that Ethiopia is more stable than it was two years ago. And that might be the exception. I really can't think of another country in Africa that's improved. Things have just gotten worse for the most part around the continent. In Mozambique, I don't know the current situation because there's no press reporting and I'm not on the ground in Cabo Delgado province. I suspect things have improved there as a consequence of the uh, action of the SADC peacekeeping was from like a peacemaking force mm -hmm. that's up there. Uh, their actions have been reprehensible at times, but it appears to have had a positive impact. But I, I can't say for certain because there's mm -hmm. no reporting on it. So there really isn't uh, anyone that jumps out. There was a very good question here that came up a few moments ago. If you let me address that, I'd be happy to do it about the grid collapse. Uh, yeah, sure. Uh, just uh, quickly touch on that, uh, seeing as there's a lot we need to get to. But uh, yeah. yeah, you can uh, you can share your thoughts there. Well, Christoph Smuts says, how would a total grid collapse of South Africa affect our neighbors or Southern Africa? Is the region going to suffer a humanitarian crisis? Well, Namibia will be okay because Namibia doesn't rely on other states for the most part for its electricity. But Swatom will be in a bind. It still relies heavily on ESCOM for its power generation because of its lack of strategic vision. Not listening to me when I told them 23 years ago to build power plants and, and 15 years ago and 10 years ago. They just were stubborn. Finally put a tender out for a, a lousy Chinese company that built three generators only one works and only at a reduced capacity so they are still dependent on escom botswana will suffer horribly if the grid collapses in south africa and will cause problems in botswana zimbabwe will also suffer but they get a lot of power from Kahorabasa. so plus they have a long history of not paying the bills and zimbabweans are accustomed to having electricity so it's not going to destroy zimbabwe mozambique most mozambique mo most mozambicans have no access to electricity to begin with so it's not really going to affect them at all it will affect Eswatini to some degree, and it will uh, probably will not affect Lesotho because they've got some power generation. But Botswana will probably be the country in Southern Africa that's most heavily affected by any sort of grid collapse in South Africa. So I think that answers mm. that question. Mm. And uh, I think we should uh, let's stay on the on the topic of South Africa's uh, neighboring countries. Uh, specifically, it's merged the the conflict topic with the 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 neighboring topic, and that it, that brings us to uh, the the two circles converging at Mozambique. Um, especially with the, the the chaos in the north there. Uh, Chris, is there anything uh, that you'd like to highlight there specifically? What's going on in Mozambique? What's the What does the future seem to hold? Um, what's the latest thing? Well, the past, the present, the future of Mozambique is a history of a country too large to be managed by those who are responsible for managing it. The governance under the Portuguese was inconsistent, and Cabo Delgado is a perfect example of that. Virtually no governance there, very little impact. The one time that the Portuguese had a major presence there was in the First World War, and, and Paul Leto from Forbeck came across the river and wiped out the Portuguese forces there and then took all the ammunition and weapons and refitted his ragtag guerrilla army. Uh, but Mozambique has never been governed adequately or sufficiently, and it's never been the case since independence in 1975, even since peace in 1992. So Cabo Delgado province is a largely ungoverned space, and that's why bandits posing as terrorists and posing as uh, people as part of the um, the um, ISIS movement, which they're not, calling themselves Boko Haram, which they're not, got a lot of press. Now, these people are sick and twisted. They murdered people. They lit a bar on fire and burned the people and shot them as they came out. Uh, unbelievable, barbaric stuff. Um, these are black Africans who chopped apart the bodies of black Africans they murdered after raping and murdering into little pieces and put them in wheelie bins and danced and drank alcohol. That's what this is about. It's about criminality. It's not about terrorism. It's being painted as terrorism. But we're talking about a max, to my knowledge, about 150, no more than 300, certainly about 150 or so of these ghouls who've gotten away with total chaos and caused total carnage and displaced over half a million, uh, almost a million people displaced because of the stupidity. And this is because the government refused to govern the area or was incapable. The FATM, that's the armed forces of Mozambique, were actually in the area guarding the total uh, gas refinery, natural gas uh, processing center on shore, and refused to move into the city to protect residents. And this is what happened. And then it got the world's attention. But it will continue to be ungoverned and poorly governed into the foreseeable future because the power emanating from Maputo, Lorenzo Marx, is too far south, too weak, too insufficient to govern this province. Quite frankly, if someone split Mozambique in half and had two countries, they'd probably be better off. Just saying. Hmm. And uh, yeah, the, there was a question here that I want to uh, see here from Kony Current here who asks, thoughts on the Grand Ethiopia Renaissance Dam. Are you uh, familiar with that, Chris? I am. It's Joseph Kony here. Welcome, Kony, uh, in 2023, not 2012. I have that T-shirt, by the way. I was in in uh, Uganda when that was when that campaign was going on, which is about 30 years too late. Joseph Kony is a reprobate, a slimy piece of human 
uh, feces that uh, needs to be taken out. Okay, I guess I gave my opinion on Joseph Coney. But uh, <laughs> if that's you, Joseph, love you, brother. Love you. <laughs> but seriously, <laughs> seriously, the Grand Renaissance Dam is a major geopolitical issue between Egypt and Ethiopia. It also affects Sudan, but they have not really engaged in the same fashion. Ethiopia is quite angry about this. Um, and the reason for it is because it takes a massive amount of water to fill this thing up. But this dam will provide a huge amount of electricity for Ethiopia, and it's already in the process. I don't know how full it is at this point, but it's filling up. But the, the Ethiopians have thus far been very pragmatic about how much water they hold back and how much they allow continue to flow from the Nile, uh, not wanting to irritate their neighbors to the north. But Egypt is irritated regardless. Um, this is a major geopolitical issue. The United States has weighed in a couple of times to try to calm the situation down, uh, but it is quite a serious issue. But in the end, it has the potential to deliver an awful lot of electricity and also a major water reservoir that will benefit um, tens of millions of Ethiopians and others in the region. So probably a net positive, but not viewed that way by the Ethiopians or by the Egyptians. Excuse me. Hmm. Right. Now let's go to uh, the country next door to Mozambique, uh, Zimbabwe. You said uh, there's a patient people sitting there, but uh, what's the latest there in regards to uh, what's happening in Zimbabwe? I see there was breaking news today that the, the white farmers that the, the Zimbabwean government offered compensation to for uh, the confiscation of their property have rejected the deal now, a $3.5 billion deal. Um, that uh, was rejected today by the the farmers. But uh, what what have you got for us on Zimbabwe, the the land of the patient people, Chris? Well, they're welcome to reject the deal because they're never going to get a penny anyway. This is just all yeah. empty virtue signaling, trying to attract foreign direct investment. But Zimbabwe still has a law in the books which is patently racist, in which you must uh, give fifty one percent of your equity to a black Zimbabwean, not a Zimbabwean, not mixed race, not koi. There are a few koi still in Zimbabwe. Most were chased out by the Bantu centuries ago, but uh, there are still a few. Not mixed race, not koi, not white, um, only black Zimbabweans. It's a racist law. It's something that never should have uh, seen the light of day, and it should have been called out by the United Nations. But of course, they're corrupt and didn't do that. So um, what's going to happen? Well, there's an election this year in Zimbabwe, and that election is pretty comprehensive. It's for president, for the Senate, the House of Assembly, and local elections. It's the whole shebang. And uh, regardless of what happens, regardless of what lever people pull, lever for the movement for democratic change, the new version of the MDC, all this stuff, regardless of what happens, regardless of what happens, Zanu PF will refuse to leave office. The crocodile Emerson Managagua, who's nearly an octogenarian now, if he's not an octogenarian already, will remain in office until he dies. Uh, he won't go away. And Zanu PF will continue to steal and persecute the opposition. That's what's going to happen in Zimbabwe. Uh, people will suffer and they'll continue to migrate to South Africa legally and illegally and improve South Africa's economy. Because if you want good service at a restaurant or an insurance agent or a car rental agency in South Africa, make sure you have someone from Zimbabwe serving you. They're polite, they're professional, and they get the job done. They have a work ethic, unlike most South Africans, which is useless. <gasps> <laughs> You're throwing some controversial stuff around here now, Chris. Um, uh, any uh, any complaints can be sent to uh, to Chris's uh, YouTube channel, and uh, yeah, that's uh, right. Uh, yeah, it's, you can find me at Odez on YouTube. <laughs> um, so yeah, Chris. Uh, now let's go one more uh, one more movement to the the, the left of Zimbabwe, and that's uh, Botswana. Uh, there was some uh, um, there was some news surrounding a former president there. Um, uh, can you tell us a bit more about that? Well, it's interesting to mention that my final day in South Africa on the 28th of February, I interviewed former president Ian Kama in person in South Africa. A wonderful interview. It was fantastic. That's already posted online. Sadly, not getting the number of views it should get because of YouTube's shadow banning. But I interviewed him in person. It's only the second interview he's given in person in recent history, to my recollection. Uh, unlike the uh, journalist who was lauded by all the leftists. Oh, you kept me. She did a great job. She asked him all the hard questions. No, she asked the same question 17,000 times. He answered it 17,000 times. And because of that, she's a brilliant journalist. Now, uh, to be fair, my interview was more to talk to him about the legacy of Ian Kama, his history in the Botswana Defense Force as commander, peacekeeping in Somalia, his time as vice president, president. But we did get to some of the controversy, and that's what I'll talk about now. His handpicked successor is Eric Masisi, Makwetse Eric Masisi. Um, at the risk of never going to Botswana again, I will not share my entire personal view of President Masisi. <laughs> they might block me from going to the country. But uh, there's been a lot of controversy. There are charges against uh, Ian Kama for him purportedly possessing unregistered firearms at his residence 
while he was present. Now, never mind the fact that I suspect he has qualified immunity for that charge while serving as president. I don't know that to be legally correct, but I believe it's true. But regardless of that, um, unregistered firearms, at worst, it's a fine and a misdemeanor. Yet they're turning into a controversy to keep him out of the country because his influence is immense in Botswana. And he could very well get the Botswana Defense Party out of power for the first time in history since it became a country in 1966. The BDP is wildly unpopular because of Masisi's corruption, uh, his government's corruption, because of services. Listen, I, I lived in Botswana and I never saw a pothole my entire life there, with the exception of the road that's traveled by trucks up near Kasani, which was heavily damaged, but it was under repair, so it wasn't like it was ignored. But never in Botswana did I come across potholes in my life. I've been going to Botswana for 30 years. I lived there. And I was in Pakalani, the ritzy, wealthy suburb north of Habarone. And there are tank tracks there that rival South Africa's potholes. I was tempted to climb into the pothole and do pothole FM from Pakalani. That's how bad it was. Uh, mm -hmm. It is shocking the decline in the infrastructure. And the excuse everywhere is, well, the, 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 the pandemic, the pandemic, the pandemic. Well, what happened during the pandemic is South Africa had draconian lockdown, but Botswana's was far more draconian and limited people for months on end to only travel in certain sectors. An entire failed approach to this suppression of liberty, the suppression of the press is taking place. Botswana is doing well economically, not great, but well largely because there's demand for the diamonds. Once again, it's gemstone quality. The best gemstone diamonds on the planet come from the Juaneng mine in the southern part of the country. But the country has a lot of political problems. Crime is on the rise. Corruption is out of control. This was a country that had the highest ranking in Africa for decades for Transparency International for a lack of corruption. Well, it has plenty of corruption now. And Botswana are pissed off. And we'll see what happens in the elections when they come up next year. Hmm. Lastly, Chris, the final uh, country that I wanted to talk about on our border is uh, Namibia. Uh, what's uh, what's Namibia looking like in, in 2023? Well, Namibia has a number of challenges. The country cannot feed itself. It's largely a desert and, um, and semi-desert country. It has challenges feeding itself. So that's an issue. But they have the resource to import food that they need. Um, they do have some issues politically with the government that has a lot of corruption and a population that's largely impoverished. And after 30 years of SWAPO, the Southwest African People's Organization, running the country, half the country, almost half the country still is in abject poverty. Now, there have been a lot of challenges to them in recent elections and municipal elections. The SWAPO party lost control of every major city. That's a stretch. There aren't many major cities. <laughs> Even Bintog is not a major city. But every significant population center. Bintog let's call is it like a, uh, just a large South African town. Yeah, Vintok is like Uppington, you know, <laughs> that's what it is, like Uppington with mountains, that's what it is. Uh, but yeah, so we'll call it every significant population center, that's what we'll say. They've lost control of all of them. They don't have a mayoralship of any of those or council control of any of those throughout the country. And uh, it's a consequence of their failures. And the population, unlike South Africa, is waking up and voting for other parties. Uh, so we'll see what happens, but Namibia will remain stable. It does have a lot of things that people want, um, and it has taken a more pragmatic approach recently to the pandemic. So they are mm. on the right track, I think. Hmm. Before we get to the, the next section, Chris, there's another question here from uh, Joseph Kony who asks thoughts on the Nigerian election. I mean, that's, a, that's some recent mm. stuff. Yeah, that just happened on the 25th of February when I was in Durban to watch the Sharks choke away a game to Ulster. Very disappointing. And unfortunately for me, uh, Dwayne Vermeulen appeared to be injured at the end of that game. But uh, on to the Nigeria situation. This is a major election and there's already uh, whining, bellyaching, complaining that it was an unfair, corrupt election. Whether that's the case or not, I can't attest to that. But uh, what I can say is that no matter who won the election, someone was going to complain that it was going to be stolen. Someone's going to complain the regulars. It's a country of 208 million people, 93 million people registered to vote. There are going to be irregularities. It's just it's, it's it's a given. You know, when the people in America say there's no such thing as election fraud, they're liars. There's always fraud in every election around the world. Any opportunity people tend to cheat when they have the chance, whether it's pervasive and widespread is the other issue. In Nigeria, the uh, current sitting president, Buhari, who is a, a war college graduate, by the way, <laughs> U.S. Army war college graduate, President Buhari's government in many respects is an abject failure. Security in Nigeria is demonstrably worse today than when he became president, although other things improve like economics and self-sufficiency. self esteem <laughs> but not the government. Yeah. I mean, the country itself, not the individuals. But um, security is just disastrous. It, his uh, handpicked successor is the one who won it. The, is it the All Progressives Party or Congress or something like that, APC? So the ruling party today will continue to be the ruling party with the next president. Um, Nigeria will continue to stumble from one crisis to another. It's just the nature of that confederation. 
or federation, however you want to look at that. Uh, Nigeria is is really just um, Africa's big boy who can't grow up. And that's my description of Nigeria. Hmm. All right. And uh, oh, that brings us to the, the next one, or the which I, or next section that I think is incredibly important and uh, are always relevant. And that's uh, all the different role players from the outside playing chess on the, the very unique chess board called Africa. Uh, Chris, I've got a, got a few here from, from last time, and I think we can start off with the, the usual suspects first that enters people's minds. Firstly, um, I think the first nation that comes to mind definitely is uh, China when it comes to an outside uh, player on the African continent. What's, what's been happening in recent years in regards to their influence? Well, the era of Chinese uh, big state-backed loans and mega projects, which began about 20 years ago, courtesy of their entry into the World Trade Organization, sponsored ironically by Bill Clinton in the United States, uh, sponsored China's entry. And of course, from the moment they entered the World Trade Organization, they've broken every rule. They've committed every every kind of fraud, put trade barriers up. They've done copyright uh, theft. They've done in uh, intellectual property theft. They've put spies everywhere. They've basically broken every rule and taken advantage of being in the World Trade Organization by getting access to the world's markets. But the era of big Chinese intervention is a lot of analysts are saying it's over. I'm not saying it's over. I'm saying it is on pause. And it's actually declined. The amount of money that the Chinese government and Chinese corporations have poured in Africa has dropped demonstrably since the pandemic began. And it's not showing any signs of increasing in the near future. The Chinese have enough problems at home. It's, it's another country that can't feed itself. You know, people talk about China, a threat to the world and, you know, a war between Taiwan and China and the U.S. All we have to do is put the Seventh Fleet in the Straits of Malacca and China will starve to death within a few weeks. They can't feed themselves without the eight million barrels of oil per day coming through there to China. Their economy would dry up overnight. They, they have no alternatives to it. You can't switch over to coal and provide all the resources. So China um, has been uh, dropping its influence in Africa to some degree because it has bigger problems at home. Now, I think China will come back when the opportunity is there and there's less problem at home. But the era of big Chinese projects have really declined. The Chinese have become much more stringent with terms on their loans. Uh, all these soft loans where people didn't have to pay them back, like they gave Angola $3 billion or something like that a few years back for oil, and it was no big deal. Uh, now they're acting like Western lenders in many respects. They want collateral. They want payback. They want to make sure they get resources. So the thing about China is that um, Africa is a useful location for it in so many ways. It's a great place to get resources. It's a great place to offshore your human capital that you can employ in China, of which there are hundreds of thousands of Chinese educated professionals who've been educated in China and around the world who have no work. So what do they do with them? They let them go or they ship them to places like Africa and North America and Europe, but especially in Africa, so they can find work and have an impact. So the, big, the era of big Chinese influence is waning, but it's not over. And no one's stepping into the void. So Africans are looking for foreign direct investment, looking for engagement. It's not coming from India. It's not coming from Brazil. It's not coming from Russia, despite the claims. Um, and the level from North America and Europe is consistent, not increasing. So uh, that's kind of what's going on with China in the near future. Mm. And uh, Lev asked about uh, the Putin's influence on the African continent. And now that you've mentioned Russia, let's get that uh, get that one going as well. Is uh, is Russia playing a major role or increasing or decreasing role on the African continent? That's a couple of questions. Is it playing an increasing or decreasing role? Uh, yeah, I said basically, what's the nature of yeah. what's the nature of uh, Russia's sure. role on Africa? It's a modestly increasing role, and um, it's. Uh, not a role that's going to have any significant impact. First off, let's just be honest. Is, but first off, is Lev in Russia, by the way? Pol uh, Pol no, uh, Lev is okay. American. <laughs> okay, all right. Well, let's just be honest about Russia. Russia is a rounding era. It, other than nuclear weapons, it has no strategic role in the world whatsoever, other than limiting Chinese colonization of East Asia, because the Chinese are colonizing Russia in the East. <laughs> the Russians are fearful of that for good reason. But Russia doesn't matter on the world stage, other than the fact it has nuclear weapons. That's the truth. Uh, people need to start waking up to that reality. Uh, it's a dying society where life expectancy has declined markedly since the end of the Soviet Union. Alcoholism is rampant. Poor diets are terrible. Oligarchs run the country. Uh, it is it is a sad, sad place to be in so many respects. Beautiful country, wonderful people, but but the way it's governed is poorly governed, and it's 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 ineffectual on the world stage. Yes, it has a veto power in the UN, but. Many, many more people are looking at the UN going, who cares what body are they? But mm -hmm. its influence in Africa is limited and it is focused heavily on dictatorships like the Central African Republic and places like that where they have like-minded fellow travelers who you know, are oligarchs or, or who are or dictators who have total power 
and something Putin enjoys and can negotiate with someone like that, or the Wagner group can get involved. And that's the extent of it. It's the Russians don't need Africa's raw materials. They've got plenty of raw materials for the most part. They got more titanium in Russia than they need from South Africa. They've got more coal than they need from anywhere in Africa. And the list goes on and on. So a lot of people are talking about Russia in Africa, and to me, it's not a major factor. The dalliances and interventions of the Wagner Group are distracting and problematic in places like Mali and in the Central African Republic, but at the same time, no one else is intervening, and so perhaps they're providing a degree of stability. Russia is mm. not the big actor in Africa that people make it out to be. Mm. Sorry. Just uh, yet at the same time, there's a bigger diplomatic uh, uh uh, factor here as well. A lot of African countries uh, not openly condemning, for example, uh, Russia's uh, invasion of Ukraine. Uh, a lot of African countries are uh, staying either neutral or openly uh, showing, maybe not stating, but showing their support. I mean, it's not very obvious uh, with many of these countries. What's going on there on a diplomatic front? Well, that's an interesting thing. First off, uh, the Ukraine conflict is not the fairy tale story that we were told uh, about uh, the evil Putin and the uh, wonderful and uh, fantastic, you know, penis piano player Vladimir Zelensky. That's not the story, the fairy tale that people were fed on the 23rd of February, 2022. Uh, the reality is that this is a conflict between two fascist totalitarian dictators. And if you think that Zelensky is not a dictator, why has he banned the speaking of Russian in a country where one third of the population is ethnic Russian? Why has he banned opposition political parties? Why has he banned the use of Russian official documents? Why the list goes on and on. He's banned Orthodox church services. What, what kind of Democrat does something like that? And I don't want to hear about war measures. That's bogus. But um, so, um, I lost. Where were we going with this? Because I got uh, yeah, how it's dividing uh, Africa diplomatically. <laughs> oh, diplomat. Yeah, that's where I'm going. Yeah. So mm. the reason I was giving that background is that um, we get this whole thing from uh, Joe Biden, who's fueling a war there, and from Jens Stoltenberg from NATO, Macron, Rishi Sunak before him, Boris Bojo Johnson, and uh, and of course Olaf Scholz and all these other fraudulent leaders ruling our countries. That you have to be behind Ukraine, and so they've come out condemning African countries for not condemning Russia's invasion. Let's just be honest. I mean, the ANC is a cabal of communist blowhards, and many of them got their acculturation and maturation in the Soviet Union, others in the former German Democratic Republic, which was not democratic, was not a republic. It's a communist totalitarian state. And yet others either in Cuba and or in China. So they love communists. They love totalitarian rule. They love ultimate power. And so when Putin gets attacked, the natural response in the immune system of the ANC is to not attack him. They may not defend him publicly, but they won't attack him. So frankly, uh, a lot of credence was given to all these African countries not backing Ukraine. I don't give a flip. It has no impact whatsoever. A UN resolution condemning Russia's invasion of Ukraine doesn't change anything except virtue signal for idiots like Joe Biden and Emmanuel Macron. It means nothing. So if the ANC doesn't want to you know, condemn Russia, good on them. I don't give a crap. I'd rather they fix the potholes and fix ESCOM than worry about Russia. I don't think it has an impact whatsoever. It's, it's, it's a red herring. Hmm. And now you mentioned Macron, uh, we are naturally moving on to the next country that uh, has a, a, a footprint in Africa, where we're going to be talking about how big that footprint is, whether it is a little baby footprint or a, a big Sasquatch footprint. Christoph Smith says, uh, Macron said that the French are going to end an era of interference in Africa. And yeah, and they they, uh, they pulled out their troops from Burkina Faso uh, just this year as well, Chris. Um, what's going on with uh uh, the, the the French in Africa oh, is is uh, are they are they making a retreat uh, or are they repositioning what's going on? Well, if we look at Africa from a historical perspective, what Charles de Gaulle did in Africa, he basically impoverished West African states from Francophone Africa and imposed seven infantry battalions located across Africa, with two in Cote d'Ivoire, one in Central African Republic, and so on and so forth. That era is gone. That era was gone by the 1990s. So I don't know what people are talking about, uh, and, and Macron is nonsense about the end of French um, interference. France was heavily involved in Mali because Mali asked for it, um, heavily involved in other countries because they asked for it. Now, the one thing that uh, Christophe mentions here that really is an important issue here is the French backing the uh, CFA. That's the uh, Central Africa, the, 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 the French franc. Uh, in Africa. It's backed by the euro. It was backed by the French franc. But the challenge here is that 20% of the liquidity of those currencies for each country must be deposited in a French bank. Now, that's the only issue I have with it, those countries. But there's a reason for that. 
These are mostly corrupt countries and the money would have been pilfered and gone and the currencies would have been worthless and devalued. So a lot of Africans can whine and complain. But the only thing that I think the French ever did that was unfair to West Africa is when they devalued the CFA by 90% back in the 1990s. That was brutal, unfair, and cruel and impoverished millions of Africans who put their money into this currencies, into banks, and overnight it was worth one-tenth of what it had been against the French franc. That was morally reprehensible. France got away with it. Um, but as far as their own financial policy, there isn't any of these countries in West Africa that's capable of managing their own fiscal policy and running their country successfully. So if they want to leave the CFA, go for it. There's competing. There's the eco. That's the Anglophone West Africa, a common currency. Go for it and watch the disaster unfold. These countries don't have the reserves. They don't have the wherewithal. They don't have the institutions. They don't have the expertise. They don't have the ability to manage their own economies in the fashion they need to be managed. Simple as that. Um, that doesn't mean I'm opposed to it. You know, I think people should be able to run their own affairs. Estonia introduced the Kroon and they backed it to the Deutschmark and they had solid fiscal policies. They put currency reserves aside that had some, you know, things to back it, like even gold and silver in banks in New York and other places. But the Kroon was pegged to the Deutschmark and it was a very successful currency. Good on them. A country of just 1.3 million people had their own currency and it worked. But uh, I don't see Burkina Faso, Niger, Mali anytime soon in the next two or three decades having the ability to come up with their own currency. As far as France's intervention in Africa being over, <laughs> yeah, right. <laughs> as soon as a French interest is threatened, France will intervene. You can count on it. Hmm. Now let's go to uh, the the country that uh, the the French uh, don't like at all, and the who don't like the French either, and that's the the UK. Um, or does the UK have? I I can't really uh, think of a, a major country that the UK uh, it has a massive sway over. Maybe South Africa to no. some extent, but no, uh, what's, not at what's all. going on? The UK is 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 dead. The United Kingdom is dead. It's a country that has abandoned uh, representative democracy. It's become a fascist state. And it is a state whose economy is increasingly controlled by um, oligarchs who, who resemble cartels in some respects. The United Kingdom is a country that has completely lost its way. And um, it has virtually no influence anywhere in Africa. And at this point, it has virtually no influence anywhere in the world. It punches well below its weight. Uh, historically and well below its weight in contemporary affairs. Uh, the United Kingdom is a rounding era in many respects in geopolitics, eclipsed by Germany, Japan, South Korea, and even China at this stage. Hmm. They have no influence right. in Africa. None. Right. And then lastly, um, or second to last, oh, second to last, last time you uh, you mentioned Turkey. Uh, I remember hmm. that was kind of the wild card country that you mentioned a few years ago when we had this chat about a country that's uh, upping its uh, its influence in Africa. What's happened in, in recent years? Well, good news for Turkish Airlines, which is a big part of that influence in Africa. They doubled their profit to 2.7 billion US dollars this past year. And they did it in no small measure because of the routes in Africa. They are really uniting and linking Africans. I can't tell you how frustrating it was to live and work and travel across Africa 20 years ago. In order to get from Abidjan to Accra, neighboring states, Cote d'Ivoire and Ghana, by air, at that time, I had to fly to Switzerland and then fly back to, to Ghana. It's just ridiculous. But now you have links to go direct between these places and in no small measure because of a handful of airlines which have been linking Africa. Those include, of course, Brussels Airlines and then also um, Turkish Airlines. But Turkey's influence in Africa continues to grow. It is a major player in Ethiopia. It is a major player now in some of the Sahelian countries. And it's also a big player in Somalia where it's interfered in the political and the uh, military situation there, uh, building hospitals and roads and things like that. So Turkey continues to have influence, which is ironic because the country is run by a fascist totalitarian dictator. And it was once a representative republic, a, 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 um, an agnostic one that wasn't influenced by Islam. But now the state is influenced by Islam. And that is not a good outcome for Turkey. So hopefully that will change. But as long as Erdogan is there drawing breath, Turkey will be a threat to somebody, certainly to its neighbors. But uh, in Africa, it's I would argue it's largely a force for good. Other than its Somali interactions, every place where Turkey has gone with trade representatives and increased trade, it's all been focused on economics and much less on politics, which is good for Africans and good for Turkey, which has a lot of products, uh, a lot of agricultural goods, a lot of mm -hmm. industrial goods to sell in Africa and makes some world class helicopters, too. Excellent. Well, uh, then lastly, uh, your country of uh, probably most expertise, uh, the United States. What's going on is... Uh, is the United States uh, becoming the best friend of Africa again? Or, uh, I mean, there, there seems to be a little bit of a, 
a push from the Biden administration to re scramble for to cre recreate ties between countries. I mean, Sora Maposa is getting the uh, all the, the the beautiful words from uh, from across the ocean. Uh, what's going on? Is uh, is the is, is the United States uh, experiencing a golden era of diplomacy with with Africa under Biden? No. <laughs> <laughs> no, not even remotely. Uh, the United States has not had a golden era of relations with Africa since the 1960s when we recognized African countries. I would say that in the 19 or that the uh, the um, the aught decade, the first decade of this millennium, the United States grew much closer to Africa in many respects with the PEPFAR program, with uh, the Millennium Challenge Corporation founded by George Bush, with a number of other number of other ventures, and even um, a few things that uh, I hate to admit is that Barack Obama did actually paid off, but not not as much as what Bush did. But since uh, Obama's left office, Africa has reverted back to the place that really doesn't matter to American politics, despite what they say. Uh, the, the most the biggest part of Africa we see in American politics is Nancy Pelosi virtue signaling incorrectly wearing kente cloth to pretend that she cares and knows about Africa. But she's not doing about Africa. She's doing about African-Americans. Kente cloth means nothing to African-Americans. It's a Ghanaian thing. And it's part of anyway. So, yeah, no, um, there is no golden age. There is no increased activity. What there is is a lot of empty promises. The United States, European Union have promised to give South Africa nine point seven billion dollars for a just energy transition. So South Africans can't burn coal to keep the lights on and stay warm and uh, industrialize because it's going to pollute and, the world. Uh, Germany so is gonna... just gobbling up all that excess coal. <laughs> well, that coal is being shipped through Richards Bay onto ships that burn kerosene, the most heavily polluting of fossil fuels, all the way to Europe and tell me how that saves carbon, to be delivered to German coal-fired power stations, which are replacing the nuclear power stations, which were clean burning. And burning coal up there. And on top of that, the Germans are also digging up lignite, brown coal, which is hideous and is even more polluting than um, bituminous coal or anthracite, uh, which is the cleanest of the coals. But uh, it's it's all just comical nonsense. It's all fodder for the sheep who don't know any better, the people that are poorly informed about what's going on in the world. Oh, it's green. It's green. No, it's not green. It's BS. And BS is brown. It's brown. And let me tell you about oh, BS. Well. It's brown. Here, it's all a hashtag sack of cock. There you go. There you go. <laughs> <laughs> all right, Chris. Last time I asked you this question, and then you came up with the, the answer of Turkey. But is there any other country that I've not mentioned that's actually a, a, a significant player or growing player on the African continent that we haven't talked about? Maybe a little bit of a plot twist type of figure. Sure. Um, people frequently mention Turkey or not Turkey, um, uh, India and Brazil, mm -hmm. um, neither of which, to my view, have really stepped up to the plate. India, I think, has the most potential to be a major player in Africa. There's a huge Indian ethnic presence in Africa, South Africa, with over a million uh, people of Indian origin or Indian pa Pakistani origin. And then you've got also a huge Indian population in Kenya. Uh, there was previously a large one in Uganda. It's come back now. Um, it was chased out by Idi Amin, but it's come back to some degree, but not like it once was. And you find Indians in other places like Botswana. Um, so there's a natural natural tie there between uh, these two places. Also, India has a lot of um, industry. As, uh, it, the lar world's largest um, um, steel producer is Indian slash French. Uh, Arcelor Mittal is a combination of Indian and French um, uh, foundries. So there's there's something there, as well as Mahindra, which is uh, a major automobile producer and other they produce other things. And so Mahindra, uh, but the thing is that these Indian companies don't seem to get their act together and don't really look hard enough at Africa. I think Mahindra could do really well in Africa, uh, not as well as Toyota, but they could do very well. So there's potential there for India, but it just isn't materializing in the near future. Uh, one actor which really hasn't done a lot in Africa, which I think think is an up and comer and has a great potential to be an uh, impactful economic player is South Korea. South Korea is an industrial powerhouse, one of the world's largest shipbuilders at this point. Uh, they have Daewoo, Hyundai, um, LG, all these different brands, Samsung, that um, Africans know and respect in some manner and want to buy these things. They really, I think, should make a concerted push to get into Africa. And I think that if Maybe, I don't know, if they watch my, 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 my program, they might pay attention and start looking at Africa. But beyond that, I don't really see any surprise actors in Africa who are coming to get involved in Africa. But I think the Koreans would do well. And I think Africans would benefit if there was more of a focus for Korean products and interchange between African states and Korea, especially places like uh, Kenya, Tanzania, on the east coast of Africa, and perhaps even South Africa. Oops, I can't hear you. You're on mute. 
I muted because it started uh, raining very heavily. Outside. I thought I heard classic, a funny sound there. Okay. Classic. Uh, yeah, I've got a tin roof, uh, a zinc roof, technically. Um, so it, uh, you hear the the <laughs> the high felt uh, rain coming in nice and strong, but it's uh, definitely something that we uh, we welcome. There's another country that popped up here just at the end now, and Crystal Smiths asked, uh, we haven't talked about Israel and its role in East Africa. Apparently, they have a lot of high technology trade stuff happening there, Chris. Uh, I have no idea. I've, I don't have any uh, uh, indicate. Oh, I, I haven't read anything about this. Have you read uh, know anything about uh, this uh, relationship here? And this is a very difficult one to cover because it's largely uncovered by the press. Uh, press in Africa is largely hostile to Israel, uh, all for all the wrong reasons, mostly because they're bigots, racists, and anti Semites. Uh, but um, there has been some reporting, uh, particularly Tanzania. Uh, in Tanzania, Israeli firms have been doing a lot of business of late that I'm aware of, uh, possibly Kenya and Rwanda as well, and Uganda. But uh, Tanzania has been the big, fo big focus. Look, the Israelis. Um, are amazing. They're world class. I mean, you look back, things like Skype, or not Skype, excuse me, not Skype, but um, what's the uh, Hotmail? Excuse me, that's what I meant to say. Hotmail. Hotmail was an Israeli invention. You know, the early web based stuff bought by Microsoft and ruined, just like so many other things. But, <laughs> but the Israelis have great. They were the world leaders in drones, unmanned aerial vehicles. They they have incredible technology, incredible software engineers, some really well run companies. It's an amazing country. I've been there. I lived there briefly. And um, they they are actively involved. Um, their GDP is larger than any of their neighbors by a wide measure, even though the population is very small. And they have the half. Where haven't you places. lived, Chris? Sorry. <laughs> <laughs> I haven't lived I just, in Asia. I reference a country. I reference a, uh, or just a region or a little province like, like South Tyrol. And I'm like, oh, I've, I've lived there. I've lived there for a portion of my life. That's a chapter in my book. <laughs> <laughs> well, we were talking about Estonia and the croon earlier. I haven't lived there, but I've been there. <laughs> mm. But uh, yeah, no, no, I, I lived in Israel. Israel briefly for a number of months on an operation a few years back with the military. Uh, no, it's uh, it's not covered by the press. It's something that you would best see if you're in business and you're running around making the circles because you'll go to meetings somewhere and suddenly, instead of seeing a lot of Chinese, you'll see a bunch of Israelis. Like, what are they doing here? But it's not the only place they're involved, but it's, it's the most obvious place where I've seen them involved of late. And again, it's difficult to report. I have to follow Israeli press to get any reporting on Africa about Israel and Africa because the only reporting about Israel uh, done in Africa is done by mostly South African papers or stringers for international ones who spread lies and um, distortions about the country of Israel. So, yep. Hmm. Well, that uh, that wraps up the role players on the on the African continent. Chris, there's uh, about plus minus 10 minutes left before we, we say goodbye. So the last thing that I wanted to know uh, from you before we start slowly winding down, it's not going to be a quick cutoff like the last time when uh, technical problems uh, destroyed the, the end of the stream, uh, but uh, we'll make sure we end it properly this time. You've uh, you've painted a bleak picture in a lot of regards in regards to uh, Africa, but are there any, even one country that stands out that you think if this was a horse, I'd I'd bet at least a dollar on it. Uh, is there is there any country standing out that's showing signs of good governance, showing signs of going in the right direction? Absolutely, uh, Mauritius, um, Cabo de, uh, Verde, uh, the Cape Verde. Um, also, I would say that Ghana is doing pretty well. They've got some real challenges, but they're doing pretty well with governance anyway, and their economy is doing okay. Beyond that, um, beyond that, uh, I would say that um, there are a lot of potential cases. Namibia, with a slight turn in governance, could really be a rising star. And uh, but yeah, that's it's not always the great things. But I have a few big bullet points I'd like to get out before we wrap up about yeah, key issues. Okay, geopolitical. So first off, a big issue for Africa in 2023 is food insecurity. That remains an issue throughout the continent. Uh, we're likely to see that in the Horn of Africa, and it's not simply because of Russia and Ukraine conflict. That's what's being pushed. So for instance, last year they were lying, saying that Sudan had no wheat because they get all their wheat from Ukraine. Well, that's a lie. Um, the state forces people to sell the wheat they produce in Sudan to the state. The state had no resources, no interest in buying it. So uh, tons and tons and tons of wheat that could have been eaten by Sudanese rotted last year was eaten by vermin, by rats and EFF who were up there apparently visiting. So <laughs> sorry, I couldn't resist that one. No, but um, so uh, that food insecurity will remain issue this year. Low growth across the continent, South Africa's growth, which was pegged at 2.3%. 
um, is not going to be that. It's going to be 0.3% according to the central bank. And I predict it will actually be a recession because of load shedding. South Africa's economy is going to go below zero this year is my view. Debt servicing remains a problem across Africa, but it's not the debt servicing to the Chinese and to the Western lenders that everyone claims it is. That's part of it. The bigger issue is domestic debt servicing. For instance, Ghana, most of the debt the government owes is to Ghanaian banks. If they fail to pay the Ghanaian banks, the economy collapses. And that's a real concern. You can re you can reschedule and get debt forgiveness from rich Western countries who are suckers and feel you know that they're going to be called racist if they don't give you a break and let you not pay back your loans. But if you don't pay back your own banks in Africa, your country goes under the waves. So it, debt servicing is another issue. And military coups. I don't predict any military coups, but we've seen a succession of them. Let me just run through the list of them. Since 2020, there have been more successful coups than as a percentage of coups than in the history of Africa. We've got them in Burkina Faso twice, Chad, Guinea, Mali, twice, the Sudan, and the failed ones in the Central African Republic, Djibouti, Guinea-Bissau, Madagascar, Niger, and possibly the Gambia, and also Sao Tome and Principe. That's a lot of coups and coup attempts for a continent that's supposed to be stable. That said, uh, I don't have all gloom for Africa. There's a lot of opportunity in Africa for those who care and want to be interested. The problem is governance, which is what it's always been. It's not neocolonialism. It's not the Chinese. It's not the Americans. It's not the French. It's Africans in Africa. Your leaders are thieves and pilferers for the most part across the continent. And it's your responsibility to vote them out of office and remove them and take control of your countries. If you live in a fascist state like Zimbabwe, I'm sorry, there's nothing short, nothing you can do except wait them out to die because even when they lose elections, they're still going to stay in office. Mugabe in 2008 lost the presidential election, refused to leave office, and Sadek came up with his grand government of national unity, and we saw what happened there. The opposition stabilized the economy with control of the finance ministry and improved things, and all the credit went to Zan and PF, and then idiots voted for them in the next election. So anyway, but uh, South Africa, if I was in South Africa, I would be trying to make sure that I was self bestia. That would be my focus mm. in South Africa today. Excellent. Some recommendations. Excellent. <laughs> um, Chris, uh, I knew I, uh, I told you we we're, we're done now with most of the questions, but there is one question here from Carl van Ruen who asks, Malawi is never mentioned. Uh, do you have any uh, inputs on Malawi? Anything that you know? Oh, absolutely. That? I mention Malawi all the time. I used to live there. <laughs> the, <laughs> no, the you're just joking. <laughs> no, I'm serious. The warm heart of Africa. No, no. I used to live there. Yeah, no, um, mm. I mention all the time. I do videos in Malawi. I report news in Malawi frequently. The, the good news about Malawi is that um, its government tends to be, by and large, legitimate and uh, hardworking. They they uncover corruption. They prosecute criminals. Now, it doesn't always happen. We had uh, Mutharika in office and his brother who tried to overthrow uh, his successor when he died in office. But, but it tends to vacillate, but mostly stays on the right path. As far as economic development, uh, Malawi has all the recipes, all the ingredients for economic success, but it just doesn't quite get there. And I think it has a lot to do with the fact that uh, it still needs a lot of infrastructure. It also is landlocked, which puts it at a huge disadvantage. And beyond that, um, some of the key inputs that people need are difficult to come by, like fertilizer. A few years back, the government subsidized fertilizer and the country's economy took off. I'm not in favor of subsidies, but in, in Malawi's case, it actually arguably work to some degree. Malawi is a wonderful place with some amazing people. I do not speak Chichewa. I tried. It wasn't easy, uh, but uh, it is an amazing place. Uh, they have great industrial centers like Blantyre, uh, other places wildly underdeveloped like Zomba that need to be developed and the whole north of the country. But Malawi, I do talk about it frequently in my program and I focus on Southern Africa. So you just got to watch Chris White Africa, buddy. Go over there and check it out. The gentleman said that. Uh, but yeah, the warm heart of Africa, the nickname for Malawi, it is a nice place. Um, and um, but the problem is that people are poor and it's going to take some growth. All of these countries I'm talking about need six to eight percent GDP growth year after year after year for multiple years in order to balance the scales and lift people out of poverty. South Africa has never achieved six to eight percent GDP growth one year after another since the end of apartheid. They hit 6.2% once under Tabo and Becky and never achieved it again. And the country will continue to but be But that was also part of a commodity super cycle, basically. It, it was, that's true. Um, but regardless whether it's commodity super cycle or not, if you can achieve it, you can lift people out of poverty. But they couldn't do it because their macroeconomic policies are failed. Their, their racist policies of broad-based black economic empowerment impoverished millions of black South Africans because it's idiotic. And it's just, you know, and it's a kleptocracy. So South Africa is going the wrong direction. But uh, uh, but Malawi, wonderful place. So you should check it out. Go there. Um, a great business opportunity as well. Hmm. 
All right, Chris, uh, that brings us to the end of uh, tonight's discussion. Uh, thank you very much for your insights and your, your vast knowledge on the African continent and also who's playing a role here. Um, thank you also to everyone that tuned in. Thank you for your comments and your questions. And uh, if you're watching and it's still it's not live anymore, you can still take part uh, in the, the bigger discussion. You can still leave a comment there. I read them all, respond to as many as I can. And if you're new to this channel, you can uh, subscribe for more conversations like this. And uh, also leave a like. It helps out the show. Um, share this link with anyone that you think will find it interesting. Chris, I hope you have an excellent rest of the week. Where can people find you just to end off? Oh, thank you very much, Ernst. Uh, at Colonel Chris Wyatt or the or, excuse me, at Colonel Chris Wyatt is the handle on YouTube, or you can just go Chris Wyatt Africa and you should be able to find me there. Join us. We are approaching once again for the second time on this second channel, 10,000 subscribers. We're very close. We had a big surge yesterday when Cyril's nothing burger for reshuffling his cabinet took place. We picked up a lot of subscribers and members. So please come join us over there. Also, you can find me on all the social media on, uh, I'm on TikTok now. On TikTok, you need to go to at Africa Matters. And if you find me at, at Africa Matters, you'll find that uh, on TikTok, I do almost exclusively South Africa and US politics and cultural things there. That's what you find on TikTok. Whereas on my other channel, it's the whole world, but the focus is Africa, but I cover the world, especially in the United mm -hmm. States. Like this morning, I did a video on the Antifa domestic terrorist assault on the police uh, training center in Atlanta. And I also did a video on Beckett Chile saying that um, he was on the verge of making arrest in the AKA murder in South Africa. So anyway, yeah, but that's where you can find me and then on, on, on Gitter and Twitter and all those other things. Um, I've been on Twitter for 17 years and I have a whole, whole 438 people follow me. Nobody <laughs> follows me on Twitter. <laughs> all right, Chris, I hope you have an excellent rest of the week. Uh, take care and everyone go check out Chris's channel. There's a link in the description for anyone too lazy to type in that, uh, that name. And uh, yeah, I hope you, you guys have an excellent week ahead. Great weekend. Also, stay safe, and I'll check you again next week. Cheers, guys. Have a good one, and God bless.